All right, it's time to have my soul ripped apart. It also was a good excuse to finally check out my Hellraiser box set from Arrow. Uh, cool stuff here, for sure. Been, been wanting to throw that in for a while. I've had it for a few months now, so it was high time to do that. And, you know, I had planned on watching all of these before Hellraiser Judgment came, but for some reason that showed up at my house two weeks early and I just threw it on so I really wish I had watched all of these beforehand because I think I would have appreciated uh, you know this new one even more because as I'm watching these I have picked up on a little things here and there that were in that one and I was like oh man now I want to I might go back and rewatch it when I'm done uh, re-watching all of these so let's get into the first Hellraiser. Now, the Blu-ray for this Arrow release, I think I'm not somebody who, you know, does Blu-ray transfers and, and cleans things up. So I don't know how it works. I don't know, like, they get a specific film stock and they can only do so much with it, right? Like, I don't know how the, all that technical stuff works on it. But man... The majority of this is so grainy that it's actually distracting. Um, I don't remember my DVDs being like that, so I'm going to have to throw in my DVD copy to see how bad of the grain is on that, but it's so grainy. It's like, wow, it, it, it's literally distracting to the eye. Then there's other scenes that are good, which I said I'm guessing that's just because the film that they had was better quality or or whatever but yeah I it's not my favorite <laughs> it's not my favorite now as I said in my review on judgment I don't have a huge relationship with with this franchise I got this shirt for 75 cents at Walmart so it's not like I own this shirt because I'm some huge fan I don't dislike it and I have enjoyed them in the past it's not it's just not something that I've ever been huge on um, I had plans tonight, they fell through, so I ended up watching all three of these in a row, and I have watched them now, so I, I'm, I'm up to three at the moment, and I've really enjoyed all three, like a lot. I, I remember not liking three at all, but I'm going to wait for the, one, the review on three, but uh, yeah, I've, I've been really surprised. Um, the music... Here in the first one, and, and plays through the rest, I'm sure, uh, did in two and three, obviously. But um, it fits so well. It's such a great companion piece to this film. Um, it just sets a really good tone. And, and so does the opening scene with Frank getting torn apart. When it just sits that really grim, dark tone that through this film has. Um, another, another tone that this film plays off of is is sexuality and you know lust and desire and and it, that's kind of you know a common theme throughout this along as well as like the darkness and the the torture and the pain and all that it's almost like a, you know and with everyone wearing leather it's yeah it's this kind of s and m and yeah i like it um <laughs> the character um, Julie, Julia, is she's the woman who plays her portrays this cold bitch so well. I mean, you even just get little character attributes here where she's just like in the house at first and she just throws a cigarette on the ground in the house and just stomps on it and then fucks her husband's brother on top of her wedding dress. Like, she's just a shitty person. And her character actually has like a moment of hesitation like when Frank because she's like completely in love with Frank he, she he's just <laughs> he's just the bad boy she needs I guess and when she finds out that she can bring him back she just you know she concedes to it and she's gonna do it and she brings that first guy back to the house and you can see like this hesitance like where he's like kissing on her and she's just like I don't know and you can see like she's like actually conflicted do I do this? Do I not do this? And when he's like, you know, whatever he says, something like, 
you're not going to fucking back out now or you're not going to fucking not do this, go through with this or whatever. When he becomes, becomes a cock, like I've mentioned this in a lot of my, la- like a lot of my reviews lately, how like guys in movies seem to just be pieces of shit who will do anything to get laid and you know, they're pushy and all. I don't know who's writing these movies, but uh, no guys I know are like that. I know there are guys out there like that, but Jesus, in horror movies, they just seem to be a dime a dozen. Um, but yeah, like once he does that, she's just like, come upstairs with me. And she's just in it. Now, she, I'm not personally attracted to her. I think she has good sexuality to her. I don't think she's miscasted or anything. I'm not saying that. Um, but what I'm saying, it goes to my point of, she is an attractive woman. I'm not for, I'm not really into her, but I can see that to a certain crowd, whatever, she'd be a drag woman. I feel like she could have gotten Frank completely healed in like an hour. Like you were a chick and you go to a bar, <laughs> you could pick up guys and bring them home to you. And like, now granted, she probably needs to take her time and do it one at a time because every one of them is just too much for her to handle. And the more it goes on, the more she's like willing to just do it again, do it again. But uh, she should have done it like a Band-Aid, man. You know, try to set up like a Bukaki video or something and get like 20 guys over there at once. <laughs> That's where I take it, yeah. The pervert talking about film. Um, speaking of which, we get some full frontal male nudity here from Frank. Uh, yeah, I wrote that down on my notes because, I don't know, I got to question some things about myself. <laughs> um and I like how, like, her first intention when, when Frank is, like, lets her on to what it is that he needs. Like, he needs flesh, he needs blood, whatever. Her first intention, this is yet again adding to her shitty nature. The cigarettes on the floor, the fucking on the, on the, <laughs> on the wedding dress, all that. Her first fucking intention is to kill her husband's daughter. Like, I just thought that was funny. Like, she opens the door and she's... Like, it's her first, like, oh, there she is. Like, I'll get that bitch. And then that, you know, the guy she ends up liking, uh, Ashley Lawrence's character, uh, Kirsty, ends up liking, like, saves the day and comes in and interrupts it. But she, that's like, she's like Caesar and she's like, yeah, her. And not only is that mean-spirited, but it's just dumb. Like, like the husband wouldn't instantly be like, oh my God, but... That does kind of go with the film because on the f- when she does bring the first guy back and he ki- she kills him and he brings him and she's like, all right, I need more. And she's like, no, no more. Like she thought one and done. So he wasn't very explanatory about that. So I guess that also could go towards the whole, She maybe she just didn't know. Maybe she thought two was going to be it and then three and then she just kind of kept bringing more back and it was just like another, another um, so yeah, uh, and <laughs> the scene where Julia decides to have sex with her husband again, you know, he brings her up and she's sitting there and then Frank comes in the room and he's going to kill her husband. She's just like, I can't handle this. No, not my husband. Like you can't kill him. Um, which she then ends up letting him die at the end. Um, but I guess that's just how broken she becomes throughout the film. She's sitting there and she's like, please, no. Please stop. No. Please, no. No. I mean, she literally says it like six times. Please, no. Stop. I can't. Don't do it. This and that. And her husband's just like going to town. I don't know if he was that lame about it. Like, he was a little more passionate than that. But yeah, it was funny because they're just sitting there like, your wife is saying, no, stop. Please, no, 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 no. Like, is this their normal thing? Maybe she's into some kinky shit and they're into like some rape fantasy or whatnot, but I just kept laughing. Like, are you going to stop? You're going to, you're not going to stop. Okay. You're just going to keep going. And then eventually like on the sixth one, I guess he's like, Oh, you're serious on the sixth. Maybe their safe word is like six no's. Um, <laughs> that awesome monster thing that comes down the hallway at Kirsty. Uh, you can clearly see, and this is not a problem at all. I just thought it was funny. You can clearly see the rig, like the wheels and everything on the rig that's pushing it forward. Man, it's bad. It's like one second, uh, and it might be due to the Blu-ray cleaning it up, 
but man, it was noticeable, like really bad, uh, you know, unless that thing is supposed to be on wheels. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what the whole monster like look was, but I doubt it was supposed to have wheels. So it was bad. Julia and a lot of other things in this movie, but especially Julia uh, is always gleaming. There's always something on her that's glitzy and glamorous and is, you know, and I don't know if that's just supposed to draw attention to her and show her as, I don't know, beautiful or sexy or alluring or something, but I just noticed like every time she came on screen, she was just one of the only things because the film is very dark throughout. Um, but she always seems to just be the light of the film, but she's like one of the darkest characters in it. So there's kind of some really interesting contrast going on there. Um, <laughs> the scene when, when Kirsty, you know, Ashley Lawrence character, and I want to talk about Ashley Lawrence for a second. Like, I just don't feel like she gets any attention as like a final girl in a horror franchise. Like, I don't know. I always hear about Heather Langenkamp and Jamie Lee Curtis and, you know, all the big movies kind of get their recognition and Ashley Lawrence doesn't. And I don't get it because I think she's really good in this one. I think she's really good in the next one. She's a beautiful girl. Like, I don't get it. Like, why doesn't Ashley get any more credit? Anyway, when she's talking to her dad and she's like, come, she's like, oh my God, daddy, I thought you were her. Like, I thought there's something had happened to you, whatever. She doesn't notice that her dad's head is bleeding all over the place and it's like seems to be cut like skins all hanging up here in this like she makes no mention of this and she sees it multiple times in multiple different lightings sources like i was, <laughs> I was just like you're not even gonna mention this you're not even gonna be like what daddy what happened are you okay nothing she's like oh my god i thought you were hurt and it's like i am hurt do you not see this like it looks like somebody fucking ripped my face off which they did. Um, and I like how just Julia just gets betrayed, like, instantly. Like, he just, he's coming. I mean, you can tell, like, he's done with this chick. He's trying to move on to the next one. He's got a younger, hotter model, and he's going after Kirstie's. And, and Julia's, like, just there to get him his flesh back so that he can start fucking his brother's daughter. Like, he's had the wife. <laughs> he's done with that. He needs to move on to the daughter. You know, this guy's into some, some kinky shit. He's got to move on. Um, so he just, yeah, betrays her immediately. The Jesus wept line, you know, that's the big line from this movie. Um, not being a huge fan previously from this series, I've, I haven't seen these movies all that much, so I never really put much thought into it, but I'm guessing not much into the Bible or, or, you know, religion or anything, but I'm guessing that, like, you know, Jesus wept on the cross, right? And, and he's, like, saying, like, I'm fucking laughing this off. Like, he wept, and, and here I am laughing. I, that is what that line means, I guess. I've never really put any thought into it until I watched that scene. This homeless guy's interesting. He'll probably, I'm, I'm going to bring him up in the next movie, but interesting character. I don't know if this is supposed to be, like, the devil or God or something, but, like, he comes in, he eats the crickets, um, and... Then he turns, at the very end, he turns into this, like, skeleton, dragon, demon, fucking weird-looking thing and flies off at the box. Uh, and then he pops up in the next movie at the end as well. So, I don't know what he is. Who's this guy that sells the boxes? Like, at the beginning of the movie, at the end of the movie, he kind of reminds me of the dude from Gremlins that's selling the Mogwais. Just, like, what's his aim in this game? Like, is he work for the Cenobites? Like, does he have some... And the Cenobites, that, uh, that always makes me... I always think that those are, like, you know, snack size portions at Cinnabon. <laughs> like, come and eat our Cenobites. Um, but, yeah, I just say... I, I, he was intriguing to me when I was watching the movie. Like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, he has him at the beginning and at the end. He's pandering, you know. He's peddling this shit all up to people. Does he get, like, paid? Does he, like, get a get-out-of-hell-free card for, for selling this shit? I don't know. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, I really liked it this time more than ever. So I think I'm becoming a bigger Hellraiser fan than ever before. It warrant my 75-cent purchase here and all the other DVDs. All right, let's move on to the next one. Hellbound.